Good morning to all of you. Welcome to Friday. I feel like I'm Mr. Magoo wearing these glasses, so I'm going to take them off for now. <clears throat> My daughter sent these to me. I got a package yesterday. Oh, I, and I meant to bring this out. I, I got a package yesterday that had the St. Francis and the Animals Who Loved Him children's book I saw for the first time. I'm sure many of you maybe already have copies, but mine finally arrived in Mexico. It was so vibrant and happy to see all these pictures of animals in St. Francis and, and the dog named Spot that Vicky inspired, because there is no spot where God is not, thanks to Vicky. <laughs> Yes, it was beautiful to see that and to be reminded of the innocence that we're called to every day. The innocence that we're called to if we would only listen to the silence that guides us into that state. We can't guide ourselves, that's the blind leading the blind, but we can be guided. And so everything we talk about here ultimately is about us being guided into an experience or allowing an experience to take hold of us that is literally beyond this world because this world that we have designed to keep us from seeing and feeling and knowing that truth begins to fade, begins to fade into that deep silence. And so today, as we close up the week, we're going to listen deeply, see if we can touch that. And so this morning, breakfast was running a little bit late, and so I just grabbed the impersonal light and just opened it up. That always seems to be the, the best way to do that, is just to, first of all, us open up. In other words, not think I know or think that there's something I need to do or think there's something that you need to learn from me. But to begin by me opening up, being innocent, and then just opening up the book or whatever book. It, it, it literally could be any book. You could open up the newspaper and read one line, and that could be the whole basis for the great lesson that you're to learn. It doesn't need to be a great spiritual book. It may be helpful, but you'd be amazed if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. It could be literally anything. Or you could hear the voice of, of any brother or sister. And they might say something that they don't think is anything other than an innocent comment, but you hear it in a way where it is heard on a deep level. That's the Holy Spirit speaking through each one of us. We just have to have ears to hear and eyes to see, because that really is the problem. I'm going to put this away for a moment. That really is the problem with perception, is we're, we're walking around the world like this. I can see perfectly fine, and I can hear everything. Don't you worry. I can hear what's going on. We don't realize that what we've really done is we've closed ourselves off to what is really there to see, which is grace, holiness, the Christ, the Buddha, however you want to describe that, and everything that there is to hear, which is the Holy Spirit guiding us into an experience that is so holy, unlike anything of this world. We have to have eyes to see and ears to hear, and that comes to us through grace, it comes to us through humility. It comes to us from surrendering and stepping back, not asserting our identity. That's one of the things we've talked a lot about lately. To not assert who you think you are to solve a problem that isn't really there. But rather to surrender and to allow grace to take hold. How do we do that? Well, whenever we feel that urge, to say, I know what has to happen here, or I know what needs to be said here, just notice that. It's probably going to happen 30 times today. This transformation and experience begins by paying attention to what you say about yourself in this world. What are you claiming? 
And you'll notice the feeling, the, the difference between the, the assertion of the identity and the surrendering into wholeness, into grace. It feels totally different. And I know that we've all felt that difference. There's a freedom, there's a lightness, there's a joy that comes to us when we just relax and fall back and give up the need to know. Just be okay with not knowing. There's nothing here for you to know except that you are surrounded by an ocean of grace that is vibrating and welcoming you every moment. Just know that and then be observant to see how that demonstrates itself. Surrender into it. So let me read this very short bit from the impersonal light. We can hear that call of silence to us into this experience. So once again, silence speaks louder than any voice you'll ever hear. It shouts without making a sound, God, God, only God. And that soundless prayer liberates the entire world. Silence vibrates without ever moving, remaining perfectly still while the earth spins and shakes beneath it. How is such a thing possible? It does it by lifting above all the shapes and forms we cling to and which cling even more tightly to us, a death grip that holds us prisoner to death. Let me read that again. How does silence vibrate without ever moving? It does it by lifting above all the shapes and forms that we cling to, which cling even more tightly to us, like a death grip that holds us prisoner to death. Silence is no one's prisoner, and death is nothing more than a joke that no one seems to understand. A joke that we never seem to get. Because if we did, we'd just start laughing. <laughs> Oh my, really? Come on. Don't you think maybe we should get the joke? Isn't it time? You can't die. The truth of who you are can't die. So what are we worried about? Why can't we just relax and just keep surrendering? It's the assertion of the identity. Remember that. It's always the assertion of the identity that is in fear. It is the relaxing into grace that we do in the experience, when we feel that experience, when we sense the approach. Okay, a bit more. If I ask you to share these things, you would do well to close your mouth. Oh, I found a typo, Brock. It says close you mouth. <laughs> to close your mouth and open your eyes so you can see the one who asks for such knowledge, see them as I am seeing them. There are no words you can speak that will come close to what I see, to what I am seeing. I am the center point of your infinite awareness. The I am presence within you is the center point of your infinite awareness, not your mind, not your ego, not your earthly possession, perceptions, but that I am at the center, and I choose to sit quietly within your wordless gaze. I like that. Choose to sit quietly within that wordless gaze. For when you choose to see through my eyes or the eyes of your I am consciousness, all things come into clear focus. What lesson is that? That's number 49. Okay. Too late to change it now. Okay, so <laughs> it's okay. No, no, we can't. It's okay. We can fix it. Oh, okay. For later. Baracus says we can fix it. That's what I like to hear. When Baracus says he can fix it. <laughs> but do you feel show. this? Do you feel this? I mean, this is momentous. This, this is literally earth shattering. 
Just enter into the silence, allow grace, surrender, Dorothy, surrender. Stop trying to know and simply be known. Mm. Stop trying to know and simply allow yourself to be known. You're already known by grace or God or whatever word you want to use. You just have to know that you're known. Allow that knowledge to take you. And what this is saying is that you do it through silence, through holding still and listening to that still, quiet voice that is always there to speak to you and guide you into this experience. Every single day this comes up. Be guided into the experience. The words mean nothing. You do and are better off realizing you know nothing. Remember who our guru is, Sergeant Schultz. I know nothing. That's the truth. But I can be known within everything. Mm, feel that. Allow yourself to be known as you are known. All right. Vicki, I have a baton in my hand and I am ready to turn it over. So take it away. Here we go, Jimmy. Here we go. Well, and I, I want to say I love the meditation. Whoever put that on before you started our meeting, because the, it carried the same idea of being fixated on spirit, on God, on light. And it made me, um, you know, I like that gazing. I like that. Uh, stepping back very much like Brother Lawrence, practicing the presence, keeping our mind stayed on what, whatever we want to call it, the light or love on God. And what I find in, in kind of living this, and Brother Lawrence has been a guide for me for many, many years. Do you want, I think to, explain who Brother, do you want to explain who Brother Lawrence is? Oh, sure. Anyone? I think Brother Lawrence was a monk. I don't know what years, Jimmy, you might know that better. I think this 14th century. Yeah. 14th or 15th. Right. And really all he did by example was practice the presence of God by keeping God, that awareness of God in his mind, in his heart. And he was probably a dishwasher or something in, the, right. in the friary. He didn't know, he wasn't avid or anything. He didn't talk, talk to people, but he practiced the presence. And um that comes through every tradition you know east and west in the course they talk about a be vigilant for god and his kingdom in christianity it's the jesus prayer centering prayer in every religion in the um buddhist and all of it the chanting all of that is to get us silent to get us quiet those are all mechanical moments to stop us to help us drop into and this is, I love the word you use, gazing. And I, whether we gaze at a baby, that's my most recent gazing experience, <laughs> gazing into the eyes of an infant or gazing at the eyes of a pet or gazing at a flower. There's a gaze where we are in communion, where we join. And that if we have spirit, light, love, whatever you call it, for me, it's simple love or God. I want to see it everywhere. I don't know what it's like to see lights and things and all kinds of um, fantastical things, but I know that that gaze brings me peace and it's lighthearted and it's happy. And it opens up that spaciousness of communion, of oneness, of wholeness with everything and but it is up to each of us to focus it's more a focus i guess a focus on love or on light and with eyes open or shut doesn't matter it's living in the presence of holiness of the love that we are falling into it surrender dorothy every other idea we have and it it, it quietly eliminates thinking for anything, for projects, for stuff to do, places to go. 
it eliminates them because gazing brings the fruit of peace and happiness and ease and grace with it. And then where else would I rather be? I, I would rather always be in that ease, in that grace, in that happiness. And then the steps unfold. And that's why death is not an issue. Because whether I'm physically here, present in a body or out of a body, it doesn't matter. That gaze is eternal. And when we rest in it, we know that. Nobody has to tell you there's no death. You fall into that spirit, that presence, and you know it didn't begin with a body nor end with a body. It's what everlasting life is. So there's no concern. And even here in time, like I don't care if I'm in a body or out of a body. I don't care. I just want to live in that presence and then fulfill whatever is mine to fulfill. Give the help, the love, the light, share that wherever it's possible, wherever I'm given to share it. And then there's no need to worry about physically dying, physically living, let symptoms come, let them go, who cares? Just stay in the presence. That's the remedy for everything. How simple is that? And how, how happy is that? <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. Stay fixated on God. <laughs> Here, Teddy, here's the baton to you. <laughs> Just stay in the presence. Teddy, yeah. let's let's hear what you have to share about that. You know, I, I'm not really sure if I have anything. I, I was just thinking while you were talking, you know, the idea that we can, um, by by not knowing and not determining and not thinking we know, open our minds so that the knowingness comes. Eventually, the knowingness becomes part of us. And that's when we see things differently. Um, I was just reading a little, uh, something that, po G that a friend posted about Jesus. And, you know, one of the things he says he, he, he talks about seeing Peter and Peter denying him three times. But his relationship to Peter denying him three times was entirely different because of the nature of the change of mind in such a total sense that he had. So what he said was, you know, I, I couldn't hold him. I couldn't find him guilty because my brother's innocent. Um, so you look at what's going on in a different way. It's not that different things will go on. It's the same things will go on, but you will see them differently. And um, when it really, I don't know how to say this, when it goes beyond the practice to knowing it's the solution, the practice is gone and living from the solution is um, what we begin to do, living from certainty of not knowing and receiving as we were created to so as to give what we've been receiving as we were created to do as well as our father gives mm. thank you you know I, i'm sitting here thinking about something we spoke about earlier this week uh, that documentary that we watched here at namaste uh, jim and andy the, dominant, the movie about the making of Man on the Moon, where Jim Carrey played Andy Kaufman, and how Jim, Jim Carrey stayed in that character to such degree that he would often turn to people, like leaving the identity of Andy just for a second and looking next to him and saying, I'm starting to think I'm pushing this too far. Do you think I'm pushing this too far? as he agitates everyone and pushes everyone to the brink. Uh, Milo, what's his name, the director, very famous. Milo Schwarman. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's you know very famous director. He, he's never had to deal with, and he made one flew over a cuckoo's nest, had to deal with, with Jack and all those other guys in an insane asylum. Uh, literally, they shot that in an insane asylum in Oregon. And, and so he and those guys, the actors who were in Cuckoo, um, before Jack got there, 
they they spent a week or two, I don't know how long, living with the people in the insane asylum so they could really absorb what this was. And and then Jack comes and and he's hanging around the actors thinking, what the hell is going on? Because he wasn't part of that. So this is what the director was used to. But he could, didn't know how to deal with, with Jim playing the role of Andy because he just he just took it too far constantly what well, that's what Andy would do isn't it that was his whole gig to take it too far the question is have we taken it too far or have we not taken it far enough I guess it depends upon what angle we're looking at it right we certainly have taken the 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 trying to prove something that is not provable too far and it hasn't worked but maybe we need to take this teaching a little further. Relax in the one trying to prove the unprovable, but be as resolute and uncompromising. We talk about this a lot. Be uncompromising with this. Don't try to justify anything in this teaching. If it says, for example, there is no death, don't get with someone and say, well, what do you think he means when he says there is no death? Pretty sure it means there is no death. Why, why do we compromise or, or try to interpret that? Take it too far like Jim did. Just take it as far as you can. And don't worry about how, how other people are accepting it. Yeah, don't worry about what's, how people are going to accept it, as Brock has said. Just go for it. Go for it. I don't know. I guess I'm in a go for it sort of mood today. Who wants to join me in going for it? <laughs> don't worry about how people are going to accept it because they're here because they reject the idea anyway. You already know that. <laughs> that's, that's one thing you certainly learn living in community, like like Namaste, isn't it? You, you're never going to do something that everyone's going to agree. The only thing I've, I, I, yeah, Marissa points up here, the only thing I've ever done here in three years that everyone liked, everyone, is this painting behind me. Anything else, there is always going to be one, two, or more voices that I don't like that. Like, okay, that's okay. You can't please everyone. So just please the one. That makes sense? <laughs> All right, I'm going to put my Mr. Magoo glasses on here. And let's see if there's anyone who would like to share anything before we lay our prayers upon the altar. Anyone here at Namaste, please let me know, or anyone in the Zoom room. Good morning, everyone. Anyone want to share anything? Okay, you guys are quiet today. I think Connie has her mic open. Oh, Connie, does someone have their mic open? Yes. Just go ahead and, hi, just, hi, Connie, just go ahead and speak right up. Okay. Um, I would like to put myself on the altar. I'm going for surgery on Monday for my knee replacement. I had one done last year, so I hope the other one will be good too. And mm. I enjoy you guys being on Zoom. It's very, very nice. It gives me a a start of the day and and it's very good and I thank everyone for sharing thank you so we lay Connie on to this holy altar knowing that she has healed this moment and every moment and for this we pray our prayers have been answered anyone else have a comment or to lay something yes go right ahead is that me Carolyn? Uh, yeah. uh, Carolyn, yes. Go right ahead, dear. Yes. Um, I was very happy to be coming today. I have a dear friend, Joan, who two weeks ago had surgery on her knee, and it just has not healed. And they, she went in yesterday for emergency check because it's swelling badly. And lo and behold, the bone above the knee joint is disintegrating. So she's in emergency right now and will have some surgery. And I, I just I would like to lay Joan on the altar for okay. okay. Yes, so we lay Joan upon this altar. We see her as perfectly healed and whole. 
And for this we pray. Our prayers have been answered. Thank you. Alice, did you want to share something? I did, actually. Um, I wanted to, the last few days, comment on something. You Every day you bring up, and it's wonderful, you bring up, let's be in heaven now. Let's, in this moment, really go for it now. That word now is a big one. And I've been playing with the horizontal and the vertical plane. It's a very interesting exercise. And we mostly live on the horizontal plane where there's past and future and, and fears and death and life and all the rest of it. That's what we know on this illusionary plane. And the other day I was in meditation and I was just being in the horizontal plane and I thought, okay, I'm going to flip in one thought into the vertical plane. Everything changed. Mm. Everything. And it was an exercise in the eternal, God's eternal now. It had no ego in it. It had no um, future, no past. No fears, no nothing. It was just, but it was everything at the same time. And I did just want to mention the power or the exercise in going from the horizontal to the vertical in our meditations and in the way we think. So say when we give a, um, uh, a want to heal, okay? I don't think we can heal in the horizontal plane at all. I think we have to go straight to the vertical and in the vertical that is the place of miracles outside of time and space and so uh when we send healing to somebody or when we i mean i forget to do this a lot of the time but when i remember i remember who i am in that does, does that make sense absolutely yeah it feels so like I your just channel wanted, I just to comment on this today well, you know, actually, Alice, that's in Helen's notes. There's a, he's got a, a long section on that. Exactly what you're talking about: switching living in the living in the horizontal and switching to the vertical, and and how he uses terms in order to allow that to occur. Um, so it, it's interesting because Jesus is talking about that all the time, rather than seeking anything on the horizontal plane. The whole teaching is to let go of the horizontal so you can get into the vertical. Because when you're in the vertical and there and long enough, you no longer need the horizontal. That's when you the end the need for space and time because you've found your connection to the eternal and it's total and it's whole and it's true. Well, and, it, it really does give you the experience when you actually use it as an exercise. It definitely gives you an experience in a meditation to actually see yourself on the horizontal and then choose to go into the vertical i'm there i'm i am there in the now already so i just thanks teddy thanks very much for that i didn't realize helen had talked about that so it's in the air anyway and that's lovely <laughs> okay thanks yeah thank you alice i, I was also going to say it sounds like you're channeling joel goldsmith there I mean, this is exactly what joel would say and as you were talking, I was thinking that the, the, the teaching is that the, the vertical dive or ascent is the same, really, because we don't know which way is up, which way is down. So the dive is the ascent, the ascent is the dive, is everywhere in every moment. So here, here we are in the horizontal where, you know, moment by moment, everything's moving, changing, but the vertical is in every one of those moments. So every moment we have that opportunity to make the choice that you've described. We can ascend, we can dive, we can awaken, because you're right, it, it just takes that decision. That's why we keep saying it's so simple. This is not a complicated thing. We tend to, to way overcomplicate it, but it doesn't need to be complicated. Just in every moment, seek only that experience, you can call it what you want. Yogananda would say, God, 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 just like the, the lesson did today. 
or as Vicky was saying today, the practicing the presence of God like Brother Lawrence. Everything that we've talked about here today is all about going into that vertical alignment. So isn't it beautiful how the lesson shows itself? That wasn't a planned part of the lesson at all, but that was the lesson. Thank you, dear. Anyone else before we go ahead and and finish up? I'm looking out to see if anyone's got a prayer that they want to share. Anything to put on the altar? Yes, Tambra. Hello. Um, I've got two people who asked for prayers for me, and so I want to share it with all of you and have a joining. My colleague and friend Dale is very afraid. He feels like his body is systemically shutting down. He's older and he's just, he's afraid. And so I'd like to pray for him to, for strength and to go through whatever he's having to go through with his body with no fear. And another friend, um, Jean and Kevin, they are dealing with cancer. <clears throat> so I'd like, and they also are very afraid. So I'd like to put them on the altar and just, and just know that they're fine whatever happens with their body and just maybe send strength so they can go through this without fear. So it was Dale and who are the other two again? Kevin and Jean. Kevin and Jean? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we put Dale, Kevin and Jean upon this altar, especially fear itself. We lay fear upon the altar. Not only for them, but each one of us make the resolute choice today this moment to go vertical not to just kind of keep moving on the horizontal looking for more things to be afraid of but to ascend and dive into that vertical where there's nothing to fear where all fear vanishes and for this we pray our prayers have been answered <laughs>